Good evening to everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jörn Fleck, the Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Europe Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event on adapting our defense capacities to a changing world with our special guest, European Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Breton. Commissioner Breton, a warm welcome back to the Council, I should say. The last time we hosted you here, it was the fall of 2021, and we were talking about Europe's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and supply chains. The world has changed significantly since then. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 and the almost two years of war since have brought fundamental changes to European security and defense. We've seen a reinforcement of NATO's eastern flank and increases in defense spending across Europe, the European Union and its members have also stepped up in unprecedented ways, supporting Ukraine with military, macro-financial and humanitarian assistance. On Thursday, we will also hopefully see EU leaders agree on another 50 billion euros in long-term financial assistance to help keep Ukraine's government services and its economy running over the next four years. Russia's brutal war in Ukraine has also revealed some hard lessons learned, not only about capability gaps among European armed forces, but also about the limits of Europe's defense industrial capacity to address European defense needs and supply Ukraine in its fight. As the Commissioner for the Internal Market, Commissioner Breton oversees a wide portfolio to keep the Union's single market, perhaps the crown jewel of the European project, working for everyone. This also includes work overseeing Europe's defense industry, which has come into sharp focus since the start of Russia's war. We have seen some, some important and often creative initiatives at EU level to facilitate military aid to Ukraine, build up European production capacity, and encourage more joint procurement. And Commissioner Breton, a former French economy minister and tech executive, has been a leading voice in the effort to boost the EU's role in these areas. So today we're here to discuss with Commissioner Breton his priorities and proposals to bolster Europe's defense industry. This event continues the Atlantic Council Europe Center's work on putting the US-EU relationship to work on key shared challenges. So stay tuned for more on our work on all things EU, especially in this critical year of elections on both sides of the Atlantic. Before I turn it over to Commissioner Breton and our distinguished fellow Fran Burwell to moderate the discussion, please, to the audience, join in on the conversation by following us on social media at AC Europe. With that, thank you again, Commissioner, for joining us. We look forward to the discussion, but first, I invite you over to give your opening remarks, and then we look forward to a discussion. Commissioner Breton. Well, um, good evening all, and first I would like to tell you that I'm extremely uh, happy and delighted to be, uh, to be here again uh, at the Atlantic Council. And the reason for uh, me being uh, in, uh, in Washington today just arrived from, uh, from Brussels, uh, and also tomorrow is to, uh, to pursue our EU-US cooperation in the TTC on uh, issues of uh, common interest, uh, such as uh, AI, quantum, secure connectivity, uh, chips, and uh, raw materials, and so on, all of which are, of course, uh, also uh, highly critical for defense industry on both sides of uh, the Atlantic Ocean. As we approach two years now since the start of um, Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, the Atlantic Council has rightly chosen to host today's discussion on adapting our defense capacities uh, to um, a changing world. Indeed, we all face new security challenges. Of course, the war in Ukraine, geopolitical tension between China and the US, war in the Middle East, this tragic event, uh, including yesterday, which uh, forced us to rethink how to protect and deter. And in the face of uh, this uh, ongoing devastating war, the people of Ukraine are demonstrating impressive resolve and uh, resilience. 
And the EU, like the US, has made it clear that Ukraine is um, our top priority. The EU has been offering political, humanitarian, financial, and military support to Ukraine, and uh, cooperating with uh, neighboring countries to support them in providing protection for people fleeing uh, the invasion. Overall, since the start of the war, EU support to Ukraine and Ukrainians amounts uh, to almost um, 85 billion euros or 92 uh, billion dollars. And we are, as you just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, about to finalize a supplementary 50 billion uh, euros envelope for uh, Ukraine facility uh, till 2027. Europe's defense industry is playing a key role in uh, addressing these new security challenges. Indeed, in Europe, we have a very strong defense equipment industrial base. In Europe, we can produce uh, all kinds of equipment. And we have factories uh, all across our continent, from north to south, uh, west to east. And I have been visiting our defense production sites, almost all of them over the past months. Encourage uh, a ramp up of our production capacity, address bottlenecks, develop industrial partnerships, and uh, engage defense minister of our 27 EU countries, starting first and foremost with uh, ammunition production, which is uh, a pressing need for Ukraine. As a result, over the past months, we have significantly increased our industrial ammunition production capacity, and I should say in uh, record time. We will soon reach the capacity to deliver one million run, when I say soon, it's uh, at the end of March, of ammunition per year uh, for Ukraine. What uh, matters now is to work closely with our 27 EU countries to ensure orders are placed and prioritized, and that ammunition is effecti effectively uh, delivered to Ukraine. Ukraine will re remain our priority as long as it takes, and we will do whatever it takes. In support of Ukraine and uh, to increase our collective EU security. And beyond the urgent imperative of the war in Ukraine, we will continue to build a European Defense Union. With the return of uh, high intensity conflict on um, our European continent, we must now adapt our armies and industries to the new reality and new threats. Security of supply and the ability to scale up have become absolutely paramount. We must produce more and faster without uh, depending on others. And we must seize the opportunity of the increased investment announced by our 27 EU countries to do it together. Because as Europeans, we must uh, reinforce our role as security providers for our own continent. This has uh, rightly been requested by successive US administrations, obviously with uh, different, uh, let's say, tonalities. But let's face it, the necessity of a credible European defense policy is a fact regardless uh, of uh, the outcome of uh, U.S. election, let's say, uh, every four years. Because whatever the U.S. government in place, the truth is a stronger Europe in NATO means a stronger NATO. A stronger Europe in defense means having the freedom of choice when it comes to our security and not depending on decisions taken elsewhere. This is... Um, about uh, what we call European defense readiness. This is why in a few weeks, I will uh, present a European defense industry strategy together with a new EU investment facility. This will contribute to a safer Europe, a stronger Europe in NATO, and uh, in turn, a safer and more secure transatlantic partnership. Because what we need now is cooperation rather than competition. In the new world order, the US and NATO can count on an increasingly credible and reliable partner when it comes to ensuring our collective security, Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Mr. Breton, let me join with others in welcoming you here to the Atlantic Council, and many thanks for those remarks. Thank you. I'm going to start with a few questions and then ask our audience to jump in. We have some stationary standing mics over here on the side uh, for those who are here with us today. And our virtual audience can submit questions by going to askac.org. Let me start uh, by noting that uh, we're approaching the second anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. As you mentioned, we've seen the EU provide considerable assistance to Ukraine, including financial assistance, taking in millions of refugees, um, significant sanctions and export controls. I think you're on your 12th package now. Yes. Um, and yet, here in Washington, when it comes to defense issues in Europe, we often think first about NATO, where we are, of course, a member. Can you say for our audience what is the value added in the Ukraine context of the EU as a defense actor and how Ukraine has changed the way the EU thinks of itself as a defense actor? Well, you know, um, first and foremost, um, when you travel to Europe and you go and visit uh, those countries close to um, Ukraine or Russia, believe me, things have changed. Mm. And to tell you the truth, for many years, and for most of these countries, since day one, where, where they joined the EU, they were thinking that um, our alliance, which is extremely important and paramount, mm. with the US and with NATO, and I say sometimes both, mm -hmm. will protect them, whatever happens. It was an insurance. But I should tell you that um, after what happened in uh, well, the past presidency in the US, of course, the president of the United States has been uh, pretty vocal on the way uh, he saw uh, NATO. He saw also the alliance with Europe. He saw Europe. Um, also, uh, how he spoke about uh, Putin himself. Mm -hmm. This changed a lot of things. And now these countries, for the first time since they joined Europe, are ready to engage, and we engage, and I engage with them to say, look, how could we be stronger together? How could we build a stronger pillar? They are all members of NATO. European NATO pillar. Because we cannot put our security every four years in the hands of American voters. We love the United States. We have our alliance. But there is a war. Mm. So I mean, this has changed really a lot of things. I want to be very clear. What we are doing is not against anyone, especially not against NATO. We are working together. For the first time in our European history, we start, and I start, as a commissioner in charge of defense industry, to have a global view of what we produce, where we produce, how much we produce, what are our bottlenecks, what do we need to do it better. Everything is equal. And sorry to, uh, to take this comparison, which is, I know, not appropriate at all. But last time you invited me, I was talking of vaccines. And remember, I told you how I visited all the factories and start to put together and then to, uh, to, to, to uh, um, let's say, force, let's say force, uh, discuss with all these factories and, 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 and make them uh, understand what do you need? People, resources, lipids, uh, 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 um, uh, any kind of components. What are your bottlenecks? And we did it. Of course, it's not at all the same thing, but still. For the first time in our history, I have finally a global view mm. of how much we produce, and especially on ammunition, but not right. only, in Finland, in, in, in Poland, in Latvia, in Bulgaria, in Slovakia, in Romania, in France, in Germany. And, um, and then how we could produce more working together. And by the way, on ammunition, 
I took um, the commitment, you remember that, it was last March, that within a year, we will increase our production capacity of ammunition, mainly 155, 152, this kind of uh, ammunition, uh, uh, up to 1 million uh, 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 production per, 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 per year. Right. We'll be there. We decided that to launch a new program, we call it ASAP. And this, we did it only while working better together. We will be able, it has been voted by the parliament and by the council. I'm in the process now with my team to finalize a uh, weather call for tender. We received 82 uh, proposals all over Europe. We select between 20 to 30, 25 roughly, uh, uh, manufacturing that we believe are extremely important in our supply chains and, and to help them to, to ramp up, to produce, to increase the production. So the one million that I'm saying is before ASAP. After ASAP, at the end of this year, we'll be at 1.3 which is much more than what the U.S. is producing, by the way. Even today, we are producing much right. more than the U.S. Um, uh, and and, and, and uh, in 2025, we'll, uh, we'll go over two millions, which is something extremely important because we believe this is something that we need to do. We, know, we understand very well, very well. We understand the figures uh, uh, of coming from Russia, and uh, uh, we believe that it's important that uh, we have uh, an industrial capacity at least um, uh, equal to Russia and, and probably more. But if I could follow up on the ASAP program, which is really interesting as someone who has followed the EU for quite some time, uh, an interesting innovation. But my understanding is that it's um, about 300,000 rounds have been delivered to this point, so it requires quite a steep uphill uh, increase at, at this point to meet the March deadline. And we do hear about European factory armaments factories saying that they're producing at top rates already, et cetera. So how do you get this last bit done to actually, this is a big increase you're talking about. Thank you, thank you for raising the question because it's not what I said. First, okay. first, you have two things. Production capacity in Europe, we are very close to one million. We'll be at one million in March. Okay. Production capacity. Then how much we deliver to Ukraine. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Which okay. is not the same thing. Okay. Because, by the way, United States is buying a lot of our product. But not only. We're happy, by the way. Huh? But, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and then uh, a lot, because we're producing much more. But not only. This is an estimation made by uh, our HRVP, the Borrell. He, he said this publicly, so I can say it. By the way, I'm always very careful with the figures. <laughs> I can give the figures of our industrial capacity, giving the figures of how, ma how much. This is, we are at war. Zelensky receive. personally, will never do it. Okay. Because this is a sensitive information which could be used. Now, the point is that probably 40% of our production today is going outside of Europe. Because there is no priorization. I propose a priorization when I, when, when I propose the law. It has been, by the way, voted by the parliament, but my master didn't want it. So now, of course, the thing is that I think it's a little bit to be a little bit more disciplined, if I may say so. We have the production capacity. Let's make sure that everything we are producing is going to, Europe, to, to, to Ukraine. I don't want, I don't recognize at all your figures. I know that it has been said a right. long time ago. Mm -hmm. You have two ways of delivering ammunition to Ukraine. The first one is you, through the European Peace Facility. Mm -hmm. And then we have a view. This is much more than what you said. But uh, I okay. don't want to give you the figure, much more. And then you have some bilateral donation from countries and countries. I know this, but this is only this con this, those countries who are in a capacity to say what they want to say, mm. and some don't want to say anything. Right. We could understand why. So that's why okay. the only person who knows how much he received so far from Europe, the only one, is Volodymyr Zelensky. Okay. Right. And for me, again, we have increased our capacity up to 1 million at the end of March. We'll be up to 2 million in 2025. 1 million was before ASAP. ASAP will help us to go from 1 million to 2 million, including, by the way, 
with all your supply chains. So, so um, I think one of the important things for our audience to understand is that um, the EU and the US, the EU is actually giving more military aid at this point, not by much, but more military aid than the United States, um, at least according to the Kiel Institute. But we both now face very big challenges in terms of continuing that level of support. Um, you have the EU summit this week that will look at the 50 billion that has been, that is aimed at going to, to support Ukraine. And we, of course, have um, the discussion ongoing up on Capitol Hill. How optimistic are you that the EU will be able to come to an agreement and provide those funds? And if the US discussion continues to go on for some time, can the EU not make up the shortfall, but can the EU step in, in to some degree? Of course, we are very, um, as I should say, uh, um, happy and, uh, and we recognize the very strong effort that the uh, US has made since the beginning of the war. Right. And it is extremely important. And we are very grateful for that. Uh, and of course, that's a very important point. Of course, the US did not spend uh, $200 billion, as I read that someone said that. Uh, it's not the public figure that I had. It's a little bit less mm -hmm. altogether uh, than uh, what uh, Europe did. But um, it's, it's obvious that without the strong support of the, uh, of the US, and especially at the beginning, probably uh, Ukraine will not be uh, where it is today. Very grateful for that. Of course, we need to continue as much as we can, because uh, we know that this war continues. And it is now extremely important to um, make sure that we can provide. So we are talking about ammunition, rightly so, yeah. because this is a very critical uh, uh, subject. But not only, of course. Um, um, uh, so we will see, of course, what happens in the United States. Uh, we hope that, uh, that um, the support will continue, because at the end of the day, um, the war that uh, um, Putin started, um, uh, this aggression in, in Ukraine, is, we know it's not only against Ukraine. We know what is in mind. And uh, mm -hmm. we are more or less all concerned with this, especially us, of course. But uh, the things are waste at large. Um, this being said, um, for us, what is extremely important um, is to increase drastically now not only our capacity to produce ammunition, but also to produce much more and faster. This is really a change of paradigm in our defense industry. And then we'll come back then to the question of the 50 billion. But the change of paradigm, our, our defense industry, uh, it was uh, in the so-called dividend of peace, was used to wait for a contract and then uh, to discuss only with the Ministry of with the DOD uh, uh, for every single member states. Uh, they were doing the best product, but uh, delays were terrible, uh, price were terrible, and uh, it was the way it worked. But we have been able to maintain a very strong base, and again, we can do everything. And by the way, things which is extremely interesting, because of uh, what we inherited, uh, uh, let's say, or if, uh, with some uh, uh, member states coming from the former uh, Soviet Union, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure, of course, yeah. not always up to date, <laughs> but this is where we want to put money to help to, um, uh, to um, uh, uh, reach against state-of-the-art uh, capacity to produce. This being said, um, we will increase drastically our capacity to produce. Just, we are spending today between 200 and 230 billion uh, uh, euros per year for our defense in Europe. Uh, we all committed, at least uh, uh, the uh, 24 of, uh, of us uh, um, one are, um, we are a member of NATO, to uh, be at 2% mm -hmm. of uh, GDP right. spending uh, from defense, which is something extremely important. While doing this, in the next few, uh, few years, uh, months and years, the sooner will be the best, uh, we will increase our spending by an additional 140 billion uh, euros per year, which means that we spend more than 350 billion between 350 to 400 billion per year. And of course, in order to benefit from this, uh, it's very important that we increase our capacity of, uh, of production. So again, we are now entering, we were in the past uh, with uh, the war in Ukraine uh, in, a, in a war of stocks. We are now entering a war of defense uh, uh, industry uh, capacity. 
So and that's where we are. Now for the, and, and I could comment more, but I would not want to, uh, to, to, uh, to forget the 50 billion. The 50 billion, of course, will be discussed um, uh, next uh, uh, Thursday uh, uh, by our uh, leaders. Mm -hmm. We know that we still have some discussions with uh, um, one of the member states. Yes. <laughs> I should say, um, that of course, that as a commissioner, I respect all the 27 member states, including the one I know best, uh, 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 but that I don't mention uh, because I don't have the right. Oh, mm. uh, OK, we have one of them with, um, let's say, a little bit uh, uh, vocal on this. On this. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, I'm, um, this is the way we work. Huh? This is our democracy. So uh, I'm confident that we'll find a way. OK, great. Um, I wanted to turn to what you said about um, how much you're spending as a, as a group. Yes. And you sound like uh, you're really working on ramping up production, but yes. certain things have to happen for that to really uh, change in Europe. You have many different uh, versions of armored personnel carriers, different nationally derived supply chains. Are the member states going to be willing to give up, you know, will Slovakia give up X equipment in order to have a more Euro-oriented um, supply chain that goes across all the member states or that streamlines this? And, what are, and the industries. We went through here in the United States a process of rationalization of our defense industries. And you have a lot of, I would call many of them, national champions in the defense industries. Will they also be consolidated? Is that needed in order for, to get more bang for the euro? Of course, we need, um, we need to, uh, to work closely together. And, uh, and of course, to have um, uh, uh, less diverse uh, uh, productions uh, and much more harmonized, that's for mm -hmm. sure. But that's our history. And we are coming from where we came. Um, this is our democracy. This is our history. So, personally, I work a lot on this, and even before I was a commissioner. And I find only one, let's say, very simple way. It's not rocket science. I recognize, I must admit. Which is, if you work together, we'll pay. Mm. It's not rocket science. I agree. But we started to do this with the European Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. And I was behind the philosophy and behind the, the first one. My idea was just to say, let's put at least on any kind of product, tanks, cyber, drones, frigates, uh, artillery, uh, hypersonic missiles. If you come to us with at least four countries mm -hmm. and at least 20% of SMEs, coming from everywhere in Europe to support in the supply chains, we will pay up front a certain amount for your research. And guess what? It works. Oh, it yeah. works. But it was for the European Defense Fund. It was the first pillar. Now we are entering, because of the war, to a second pillar, which is let's buy together to do it faster, mm. quicker. Mm -hmm. If you come again, that's a, a program which is called EDIRPA. If we come again at three countries together, and you join, and you buy together same product, we'll pay, we'll participate, 10% or 15%. Then come ASAP, now production, not buying. Right. If you are together, at least four, three, four, you put together to enhance our production, we'll pay up front. OK, it's not rocket science, but it works. Right. It works because the industry needs to change their own business model. Again, moving from a logic of arsenal, where I was uh, able to do everything. Mm -hmm. But now, let's work together. And we encourage drastically. When I'm touring, I'm always encouraging, with whom are you working for the supply chain, and, and so on. We are encouraging drastically companies to work together. If they come with this, now we will also enhance and pay also up front. Now we do for ammunition. I'm working, as, you, as I said in my uh, uh, preliminary, preliminary remarks, um, uh, on the 27th of February, 
for a much broader defense industrial policy, where we will have again these three pillars, regulatory, uh, 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 supply chains, and financing, with the same, the same um, uh, uh, let's say, um, concept. Let, let me ask one last question before turning to the audience. So if anyone here has a question, you might want to get yourself over to the mic. Um, what is the role then as Europe moves forward with these enhanced production capabilities, increasing cooperation within its defense industry? What will be the role for US companies in terms of defense in the defense industry in Europe? And I note that recently the European Defense Agency signed an association or an administrative agreement with the Pentagon, uh, allowing a lot more um, consultation between the EU and uh, the Department of Defense. So how, how's the transatlantic element of this development that you are spearheading in Europe? So first, again, uh, we have a lot of cooperation. That's, that's extremely important. I'm coming from the private sector, it's extremely important. By the way, today we are a very open continent. Since the beginning of the war, 68% uh, of uh, the military purchases from Europe has been made in the United States, 68. So I mean, we are more open than anybody okay. as a continent. I would love that uh, the US will be as open, by the way. I will, I will love it. <laughs> even, even half of it, will be, I will be extremely happy. But, uh, but, uh, but that's, that's the reality. Yeah? And um, now, um, uh, there is this FMS, US FMS, uh, uh, which is extremely important. And I want to work also in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the program I'm working with, the EU FMS. FMS is a very important program, very smart, by the way. And this is thanks to this that US is able to export. So I think we can export from both sides. It, it mm. will be a win-win win, win strategy. But remember, uh, uh, we are committed, and we have no other options to increase, again, our capacity to produce more and to spend more in defense in Europe. We have no other options. Of course, um, uh, since I believe it's important to do it quickly, uh, will uh, defense readiness will not be ready for everything. Yeah. So of course, it's an opportunity. But at the end of the day, um, um, I just remind that in this very um, ha uh, hazardous, uh, environment we are now uh, living in. Having a partner, an ally, like Europe, much stronger, it's a very good news for NATO and for the for United States, I believe. So let me go to one of the questions from our virtual audience, um, and that is, you are, putting, uh, you are putting forward later this month this in the defense industry plan and, and uh, investment program as well. These are both big things, and we are already at the time when the parliament is running out of time. Um, so much of this will be addressed during the next term, if I can put it that way. Are you confident that, that do you think the elections will change the direction in which you are moving? Uh, How do you see the next parliament and commission addressing? So that's a very important question. And first, um, uh, if you allow me, it will uh, um, give me the opportunity to tell you that uh, I count also on this um, next uh, um, UCO, uh, um, uh, which will uh, be convened uh, uh, next Thursday, that discuss also 2024. Okay. We cannot, of course, we have to speak about the next mandate and the next uh, five years of the college, of course, and I will come back in two minutes on this, but we cannot miss 2024. 2024 is an absolutely critical year. We have programs, uh, but we need to continue. We have, uh, as I, I, I mentioned, ADFPA, we have ASAP, we have all these kind of tools, but we need also some financing. So I, I, um, I know that it will be a discussion on this. I'm pushing from where I'm standing. I'm the commission and chair of uh, defense industry. So uh, you, could, uh, you could say that it's my, uh, my role. But from everything I see, I, I'm, I'm, I really hope that uh, member states will be able to, um, to discuss also of an envelope that we need uh, both for, uh, the, to continue to support uh, drastically uh, Ukraine and also to enhance our um, defense industry in 2024. Now, for uh, um, uh, the next, uh, next mandate, 
Yes, in this um, in this proposal, of course, uh, we will have um, the, the three pillars I already mentioned, and it will be much broader, of course, mm. uh, than uh, just ammunition. You probably uh, saw that I was um, in a meeting a few weeks, a few days ago, uh, which was in my um, political party, which is very new, and we were discussing uh, what should we, we should do in the next five years. And I said that it, I believe it will be important, also in addition to what we will present uh, the 27th of February. Uh, to, uh, to have uh, also um, uh, a fund, uh, and I mentioned the, the figures of 100 billion. It's my view, of course. Right? Yes. It's not yet uh, discussed, but this is, we are a democracy. But my role is also to propose, mm -hmm. uh, of course, um, object, and then, of course, this has to be discussed uh, by our co legislators. Why 100 billion? Uh, because I believe that uh, half of it uh, should be used to continue to support Ukraine on the defense part and also to enhance our industrial uh, base, and half of it is uh, uh, to, um, uh, to enhance our capacity uh, to protect what we called in our strategic compass, uh, because now you know we have a strategic compass. Uh, finally, uh, the 27, uh, we have a global view of what we should do in, in, in defense uh, in the uh, so-called contested uh, areas. What are the contested areas? Space, cyber, uh, um, air, uh, air defense, and maritime. And for all these four spaces, contested spaces. Not one single country can protect these mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we learn, we, are, we know how to do it already. We do it, uh, uh, for example, you know that I, I, I've launched this uh, Iris uh, uh, Square constellation, mm. which is a low medium uh, orbit uh, uh, constellation to be able to, get to offer uh, connectivity, but also uh, space surveillance, space, space to space. Uh, and we have the governance to do it. We have also the tools to invest uh, together. We have uh, we were working on a cyber shield uh, in cyber security, mm -hmm. and not one single country can do it. So we do it all together with a joint financing with S uh, with SOX security operational centers. We need probably six seven of them, uh, very large, uh, to protect uh, Europe in the, uh, or let's say to to um, uh, try to. Um, uh, detect uh, uh, very early any kind of cyber attack on our uh, critical uh, infrastructures. Uh, we uh, uh, believe that it's important to have also, cyber, uh, let's say, uh, 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 a dome, uh, an air dome to protect, of course, against missiles and maritime. And maritime, we need. We have the, 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 the largest exclusive zone in maritime on the planet. We need, of course, to protect it. And for this, it will be definitely joint investment. Uh, uh, mm. Because uh, and that's uh, uh, and, and 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 it's working because for for most of them at least for the first three uh, contested uh, spaces areas uh, there is no armies yet or let's say it's a start so it's easy to start together and to have the right governance and we do it mm -hmm. so um, uh, that's also a way to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to work even closely, including with our dedicated uh, uh, forces, uh, and, and say also European forces. By the way, for the cyber, we will have a dedicated uh, 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 cyber reserve mm. uh, made of uh, Europeans that we will be able to, uh, um, uh, to help uh, to support uh, uh, any kind of uh, attack in any member states. Great. Let me bring in the first one here. Please identify yourself. Uh, good evening. My name is Leonard Müller, and I'm a graduate student uh, at Johns Hopkins SAIS here in DC. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming and uh, giving us the time. Uh, I have two questions for you. First of all, you mentioned short-term um, the supply chain issues, probably a bit of a long-term project. But in the short term, how are you going to approach and try to fix the problem that if we take the scenario that the US will reduce their support for Ukraine, certainly European countries have to set up and pay more. We take Germany, the scapegoat, 20 billion support. France, your home country, 1.7 billion support around. How are those countries like Spain, France, Italy going to probably hopefully spend, uh, step up a bit uh, their spending to carry the burden all together if the US, US reduces their, their support for Ukraine? So let me bring in one more question as well, because we we're getting close to the end. So the next Thanks. person as well. Um, good evening. Thank you for being here. I'm Jordan Jefferson uh, from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. My question for you is uh, there's been a lot of uh, not support for more Ukraine funding. Uh, I wanted to get your perspective of people who come from communities to where their state and local municipalities have not 
been sustained from the federal government, and what would your take on why we should support uh, Ukraine funding from those uh, from those constituents? So for the two, two thank you for, for for the two questions and um, congratulations for your studies. And we need we need young talents uh, in this uh, in this area. Um, um, of course, um, um, there is you know putting a package of fifty billion. Uh, the one we will be discussing uh, in uh, the, uh, our head of states will discuss uh, in, in, in three days. This is a lot of money, but and this is also the answer to uh, to the second to the second question. It's very limited regarding uh, uh, what we spend overall. I mean, look for the um, uh, COVID, we have been able in a few weeks, for the first time in our history, to decide to put on the table 700, 750 billion euros with a joint uh, uh, indictment, which was uh, our, some said Hamilton effect, maybe it was a bit exaggerated, huh? but, uh, but at least for us, it was a, a quantum leap. Uh, it was, uh, uh, so again, regarding the whole budget of all our member states, this is important, but not too much. And this is the price also of the freedom of Ukraine. And remember, if you go to all those countries I mentioned, mm. they have, it is their words, some difficult, some say terrible experience over decades with their neighbor. Believe me, they believe that it is absolutely um, existential to make sure that Putin understand that he cannot continue or do elsewhere what he did for Ukraine. And that's why this is so existential for all these countries, and they're part of Europe. This is Europe. So, I mean, uh, 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 you cannot say, well, here, I don't care because I'm a little bit remote. Uh, no, this is Europe. And we have also our article, so-called Article 5, uh, as European countries. If one country is under attack, we need to protect it and to defend it. This is why we are a continent. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and again, um, uh, coming back on the supply chains and so on, of course, uh, uh, this is um, uh, some money. But I should tell you that in any countries I visited, and, and I visited the 27, I'm, I'm discussing. Visited is not the right word, I'm discussing. There is no one saying, no, we, uh, we should not increase our capacity to produce. There is no one yet now saying, I will do it alone. Of course, some of uh, our biggest member states had maybe this tendency, <laughs> including two of them. <laughs> but uh, I'm working hard <laughs> to uh, make them understand that when you speak about supply chain, this is all together that we that will find a way. Let me, let, let me give you a final example of what I'm telling you. In order to make ammunition, you need powder. And there is a, a bottleneck for powder. Because in order to make powder, you need cotton. And uh, uh, the biggest supply from uh, the cotton used in Europe was coming from China. And I don't know why, over the past few weeks and months, I understand it has been difficult to get this very specific cotton, which could create a bottleneck. Then the industries sit together and said, what can we do? Let's find another source. And they came with other capacities, including now using cellulose from the wood industry. Mm. And it has been certificated thanks to innovation and working together. Just saying that, of course, uh, uh, and, and not one single country came with this. They were working together. So that's, uh, again, uh, um, uh, I'm not over-optimistic, but I know that if we don't do anything, I may be uh, under-pessimistic. Mr. Breton, thank you so much. And my apologies to those who didn't get uh, a chance to ask their questions, but we've hit the time when we have to finish. Let me just say that we'll all be watching at the European Council this week uh, to see, hopefully, the 50 billion start to move forward. 
Um, and we also will be looking, I believe it's February 27th, yes. when you put forward the defense uh, industrial strategy. And uh, thank you very much for coming back to the council again to speak on this topic, which I think is a real watershed in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.